Welcome everyone to How is Asset Management Implemented in ServiceNow, presented by John Finnerty. We have time reserved at the end of the webinar for Q&A, so please feel free to type any questions into the question section. Today's webinar is also on social media. You can follow, comment, and get regular updates for today's webinar with the hashtag AlcorWebinar. That's hashtag or number sign A L C O R W E B I N A R. John Finnerty is a principal consultant and solution architect at Alcor Solutions. He has over 15 years of consulting experience with multiple enterprise software vendors. With his incisive and vast experience with the ServiceNow platform, he is well qualified to walk us through this webinar on asset management in ServiceNow. I will now turn the webinar over to John. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out for our, the Alcor webinar series. Um, as Jeff had mentioned, today's uh, presentation is going to be based on how is asset management implemented in ServiceNow. Uh, we're going to be um, going through some uh, slides and some notes here as well as a demonstration of some of the uh, key features and benefits of the um, asset management piece inside of ServiceNow. And uh, we'll reserve some time at the end for any kind of questions that you may have about our presentation and about anything that I've shown you or anything else related to the use of asset management and the related components and processes uh, inside of ServiceNow. Um, just before we get started, um, this is the first of a series of asset management um, seminars or webinars that we're going to be doing uh, in this format. Today we're going to be focusing on the sort of core uh, capabilities and functionalities around hardware asset management. We're not going to be really looking at uh, any software asset management and asset optimization in any great detail in this session. There's just not enough time to deal with all of it. So that is definitely um, a scheduled event for or scheduled topic for a future session. So if we can uh, retain, if you have any questions about that or our future sessions, please um, keep them at the end. The agenda for today's session. <coughs> We're going to be looking at um, ServiceNow IT Asset Management. We're going to be discussing some features and benefits and uh, doing a walkthrough of a scenario of asset management and some of the uh, related components. And we're going to be discussing some of the implementation methodology that Alcor has developed over the um, last several years uh, doing actual asset management implementations with a number of our clients. Okay, so ServiceNow Asset Management, there's a number of features and benefits with the uh, tool. Um, enables you to uh, track and report on assets, of course. Manage assets in conjunction with the configuration management CMDB process. We're going to be looking at that in terms of product models as to how those two processes go together and how we can benefit from both a, a strong, uh, robust CMDB process as well as a related asset management process, too. We're going to be looking at managing the life cycle of the assets all the way through request, procurement, life cycle, retirement, uh, retirement and uh, disposition of the assets themselves, reporting, auditing, tracking, all of the transitions of the life cycle points of, of the asset. Enables you to get a handle on software licenses and compliance. Again, we're not going to really touch on software compliance in, in this presentation, but we'll look at some of the uh, benefits around um, the reporting capabilities around that. Uh, ensures data quality so that you've got better quality data around um, the asset life cycle, um, around the inventory process, procurement process, provisioning process, and asset life cycle. Um, enables you to uh, deal with contractual and financial aspects of the asset management process using native processes in the ServiceNow platform. Enables the control of inventory that is purchased and used, uh, enabling relationships between assets and users, assets and locations, assets and departments, both internal as well as um, external entities. Um, improves and reduces the cost of purchasing and managing assets. An integrated end-to-end -end process does bring value and insight through the audit process, through um, strong controls, through strong compliance to uh, governance standards, through the asset process to give you better quality data, as well as auditable data and controlled data to uh, back up the um, requirements, reporting requirements with solid, uh, verifiable data. Uh, manage the asset lifecycle from planning to disposal. That's a repeat of a bullet point on the first slide. Uh, achieve compliance of relevant standards and regulations, uh, things like Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, anything to do with external um, controls or external, external governance requirements can be um, 
stretched through or can, can be implied or placed on the asset processes to provide the audit controls and audits um, governance um, uh, John, uh, of those um, external. Uh, John, uh, we aren't see, we are only seeing the cover slide. Can you start thumbing the slides down, please? I've been doing that on it. It's uh, only showing the. I was just about to oh. say that. Maybe um, you're on a different I'm, screen, John. I'm live. There we go. Now? now it's changing. Okay. Um, back up one slide there. That was that slide. That's this slide. Okay. Um, Improve IT service end-to-end -end users, again, um, pretty well the core objective of any ITM, ITSM process. ServiceNow does provide um, the strength and width and depth of those processes to do um, process um, improvements and life cycles from an end-user perspective. And create standards and processes for managing assets. <clears throat> This slide shows you um, ServiceNow's enterprise service model and where IT asset management fits into the overall ServiceNow platform. Uh, between the service the providers and the service consumers and departments, we can see that um, IT asset management fits into service management and operations management very, very well. Um, it's part of the business management strategy around governance, IT compliance, IT GRC, uh, those types of processes. Um, it fits into service management from both a service catalog, CMDB, as well as um, incident problem change management with a relationship between assets and um, CMDB uh, configuration management processes. It fits into operations management as well. Um, ServiceNow Discovery, uh, other external discovery tools, are typically a data source for uh, both CMDB as well as the asset management processes. We're going to be looking at that a little bit later on. Um, configuration automation, uh, also part of an IT um, procurement and um, fulfillment process, as well as application development. Asset management fits into the application service creator uh, processes very um, well with um, the ServiceNow platform. ServiceNow IT asset management um, touches upon the following processes in ServiceNow, as illustrated by this slide. Request management, stockroom and inventory management, uh, deployment automation, um, discovery management as well, um, planning procurement, financial aspects of the IT asset management process, as well as IT governance. IT asset management, contract management, software asset management, all of those um, items across the bottom uh, are all related processes and support process to a core IT asset management strategy inside of ServiceNow. Some of the benefits of um, IT asset management, a single source of truth, uh, enables you to make informed asset decisions around capacity, asset refresh, vendors, and more, uh, using accurate asset portfolio data that's consolidated into a single system of record. Access both business and configura configuration information on assets by linking the asset repository with a ServiceNow configuration management database. View a single pane dashboard that shows the organization's software portfolio, including what's owned, what's deployed, and the variance between the two states. Uh, enables you to monitor key performance indicators and trends with ServiceNow performance analytics around um, asset management, asset lifecycle. Reduce costs, uh, lower software spend by making informed decisions on software needs and the potential to use lower cost software versions. Reduce wasted resources by identifying and removing underutilized assets. Automate asset lifecycle processes in order to eliminate repetitive human tasks and associated costs. Consolidate vendors and asset models and retire contracts that no longer provide to the business to lower maintenance costs. Influence asset demand and expense by displaying asset prices in the ServiceNow service catalog and issuing chargebacks using ServiceNow IT cost management. Another benefit is enhanced governance. Enables you to control asset distribution by centralizing requests through a role-based service catalog. Uh, enforce policies, contractual agreements, and regulatory requirements when new requests are submitted using workflow to validate requester eligibility and to obtain approvals before request fulfillment. <clears throat> Confirm all internal and external compliance requirements are met by periodically testing controls with the service IT governance and risk compliance application and track entitlements so that authorized, unauthorized software can be flagged for removal or new license purchases. 
benefit of mitigating risks is it enables you to actually track software license compliance and usage, reduce audit preparation efforts, notify contract owners when renewal and expiration dates approach to prevent lapses in coverage, strengthen change management risk calculations by including business information about assets such as age or lease expiration dates. Um, entitlement space software asset management. As software costs continue to rise and the risk of vendor audit increases, software asset management helps organizations track the software used in the enterprise. ServiceNow Asset Management collects data from discovery tools and other sources to capture an accurate inventory of the software the organization is actually consuming as well as what's been purchased. ServiceNow Asset Management breaks the vicious cycle of blindingly purchasing more software every year to ensure compliance and exposes the unauthorized and potentially unlicensed use of software. License managers can also make informed decisions around how to provision expensive suite licenses and cheaper alternatives and when to use upgrade and downgrade rights to further optimize software investments. In terms of policy-driven configuration management and asset integration, ServiceNow Asset Management lets the business decide which assets to include in the configuration management database in an automated manner. By having both software asset management and ServiceNow configuration management on the same platform, the traditional challenges around data integration, normalization, and data reconciliations are eliminated. As new assets get added, the business rule engine takes action and creates configuration item records in the CMDB when necessary through the asset management process. Easy catalog planning with vendor data. Asset managers can place offerings straight into the service catalog. Software asset management can easily take in ven data from vendors and define which asset standards should be offered to end users via the service catalog. This is done directly from the asset system without the need to build complex web pages or ask for more technical um, resources to um, accomplish this. As service catalog items are published, asset managers can also decide which group of users should be authorized to request the asset. And internal and recurring pricing is supported to account for the different chargeback models that organizations may wish to deploy. Asset provisioning. When new requests come in for assets, the fulfillment personnel can quickly review available inventory from stock rooms. This means that an organization can provide quicker service for commonly requested goods. It also allows the organization to repurpose assets that have been returned to the stock rooms for disposition or for release for use elsewhere in the organization. For requested items that are not in stock, ServiceNow makes it easy to create that purchase order with a single click. Ordered assets are tracked and eventually arrive on the loading docks where they are received in an automatically created assets in ServiceNow. In this very important step, asset records are created cleanly from the beginning with complete data related to the asset model, user request, order, cost, and much, much more. The benefit is that the received assets go directly into production much faster since it's clear who requested the asset, where it is needed, and for what purpose. Demonstration, IT asset management demonstration and service now. What I'm going to do now is walk you through a small um, request fulfillment process using two roles, um, an asset and procurement manager as well as an end user role. We're going to walk through some of the features that we just discussed in the preceding slides. Um, and just show off some of the capabilities and feature benefits of the ServiceNow platform. Bear with me for one second while I just spin up my browsers. <clears throat> okay, um, what we can see now is a standard ServiceNow um, dashboard with an asset management overview page. If you're familiar with the ServiceNow platform, these are gauges on a landing page designed to provide information around um, key performance metrics and um, measurements and um, around uh, the asset management process. Some of the gauges you can see here are some breakdowns for Microsoft licenses, um, some breakdowns for configuration by manufacturer, computers by manufacturer, um, configuration types, computer OSs, some asset retirement data as well uh, from both the contractual perspective and the individual assets themselves. It enables you to understand what assets are coming up for uh, renewal or coming close to their end of warranty or end of, <clears throat> excuse me, maintenance contract um, dates 
and then uh, click through and take further action to um, process those assets through um, the life cycle. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to start off with um, a user view of um, the asset management process. So in this browser here, um, this is uh, our employee, Joe employee. Whoops. And this is Joe employee's self-service page. Joe is classified as a user uh, inside of ServiceNow. And so from a user perspective, there's a number of things with an asset management process that you can provide to the users to enable them to understand um, what assets they have access to, what assets they have um, assigned to them, lifecycle information on the assets, as well as a service request process for um, requesting and, and um, requisitioning new assets. So normally what we're going to do is we start off here. Um, Joe's got a, a My Assets click um, on his navigator bar here. This is going to show me an asset page with Joe's view of his asset perspective. So you can see down here in our key metrics, Joe's got six assets assigned to him, designated by this list view up here. Got a couple of computers, a couple of printers, a camera, and some other stuff down here, which is designated as unknown. Um, we can see here that there's some refresh dates available to Joe. <clears throat> Excuse me. That means in terms of his um, present status and his present relationships with his PC um, asset classes, he's got 365 days to go before he's uh, entitled to a new refresh on his um, personal computer and laptop computers. This allows us to look at his mobile refresh date. So he's got zero days to go. That means Joe is um, ready and entitled to a refresh on his mobile device. Down here, we can see assets by model. Um, he's got some computer stuff, some peripherals, as well as a printer. So another graph here to show Joe just some of his information um, in the system for his asset relationships. <clears throat> Down here, Joe can see his existing asset requests, as well as their um, stage in the fulfillment process. So we can see that he's actually got an ASUS A53, it's gone all the way through, and it's been delivered to him, and he's, um, in, in, he's been associated with that um, asset, and it's now in that system. Okay? So... Regardless, Joe doesn't like this one, so we're going to go get another Asus A53 computer. So Joe's going to come up here to the service catalog page, select the hardware item through here, and this is the hardware um, service catalog with the items that's uh, available for Joe based on his role. Let me just take a step back there. You can see some um, summary information as well as some, um, whoop, sorry about that some information around um, the details of each of these hardware items and hardware models. Um, this relates to a specific catalog item, and you can see some things here relating to color, operating system, CPU speed, memory, all those sort of standard things for um, laptops um, class of assets. We can see some pricing information across here. Uh, an Asus is going to cost them $529, MacBook Air 13-inch $899, and other variations um, on that based on the asset class and the capabilities of the hardware. So what Joe's going to do is he's going to pick an Asus A53. It's going to be delivered to him in two days. It's going to cost $529. He's going to order that right now. And that's going to enable um, the asset system to um, start to process this request. You can see here that we've got some, uh, some validation, some feedback here that the order has been request. Here's Joe's request number. And then the, there's the estimated delivery time based on some ServiceNow automations and workflows around this asset class. <clears throat> By expanding upon this stage here, this shows me, uh, this shows Joe uh, the stages of the delivery of this fulfillment request. Uh, it's automatically approved. Uh, there's some automation features um, inside of ServiceNow which are triggered on the price of this particular asset. So anything below a certain dollar value, for example, can automatically be approved or it can be referred to Joe's manager for approval if it exceeds a certain value. In this case, I think the threshold that we've got set up is like $1,000. So this starts off um, the first stage of his request by automatically approving it and putting it into the fulfillment process. Joe's happy. He's ordered his new laptop. Now he's going to sit back and wait for it to be delivered. Meanwhile, over the asset management and procurement role, we're going to go over and look at our procurement process. This is our procurement overview. And from a, a procurement manager's perspective here, we can see a number of different metrics that are being tracked for um, this particular role. Uh, the top section here shows us requests that require sourcing. So in the case of uh, Joe Employee's recent request for a new laptop, this shows that Joe opened up a laptop on um, Actually, he's got a due date, and it's an approved state, and it's pending for procurement review. 
and uh, the procurement sourcing part. There's some purchase order information down here. We're going to look at that in a couple seconds here once we generate a new PO for Joe's new laptop. And we've got some high-level metrics in terms of expenditure by vendors as well as orders by vendors. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click through into this request here. And this is the procurement view of um, the request that Joe just opened up. You can see here it's for Joe employee. There's a due date I'm established. There's a pricing established. Pretty well the same information that was displayed to Joe through the service catalog. Tabs across the bottom here show me requested items. And in this case, there's a single requested item here for uh, Joe's um, Asus A53 laptop. Uh, we could have multiple um, requested items on a, on a single request. Depending on the nature of um, the catalog item that Joe um, had opened up a request on, this can support multiple um, independent um, request fulfillment processes with their own due dates, their own fulfillment processes, and their own steps for um, stages for fulfillment. In this case, we've just got the one, and that enables Joe to see that he's requested this, um, sorry, the procurement manager to see that Joe's requested this um, particular class of laptop from Amazon and with a due date here. In addition to that, the ServiceNow workflow related to this request has also created a ta catalog task which enables a um, sourcing decision to be made from the procurement process. So we can go in through here to look at this catalog task. This is related to the fulfillment of the original request. And we can see here uh, some information around uh, this particular request and how this um, particular, how this um, asset is going to be fulfilled. We can see some state information up here. This approval has not been um, requested yet. State is open. It's assigned to the procurement group. Um, short description is source request items. And we can come down through here and then select this source request button. <clears throat> And that pulls up some information here related to the um, asset that Joe, or that Joe has just selected through here. We can see that we've got uh, an Asus A53. This button here is going to show me the inventory status, the present inventory status um, for this class of um, asset in the ServiceNow system. So by selecting on this, I can see that I've got um, one or more. Yeah, I've got one of these in the San Diego stock room. I can provision that um, asset to Joe or um, I can select none and actually generate a purchase order um, for this request as well. Um, ServiceNow wants you to fill in a destination stock room for when this um, asset is delivered from the vendor. So by selecting this, I can just pick one of the stock rooms. Let's take California Warehouse. And you can see from here that we've got the vendor, uh, in this case a single vendor, with a contracted price of $529 for um, this asset. <coughs> This also supports multiple vendors as well, so if there was multiple sources of this particular asset, we would see the pricing information, the availability information from the multiple vendors at this step in the process. So by selecting this and selecting the destination stock room, um, ServiceNow Automation is then going to create a purchase order request to Amazon for this class of asset to be delivered to that stock room within the two-day period um, as part of that um, vendor SLA. So by selecting OK, that's automatically going to close that catalog request. You can see the state here has now changed to close. And as part of um, the parent request, it's going to move on to the next step in the fulfillment process. So let's just hit Update, take a step back. And you can now see through here, uh, under our Purchase Order tab, we've got that PO then tracked against this original request for um, Joe's new laptop. So if I come into this Purchase Order, you can see here that um, there's some information here that can be provided around the shipping information, shipping details, um, terms, credit terms, ship rate, total cost, details around the actual item itself. It's been requested and reserved for Joe employee. It was requested on this date. Uh, when we do the order date by selecting this button here, this will automatically fill in those details and then estimate the expected delivery from um, that vendor. And then at this point, we can also tie this back to a contract if that's relevant for this vendor by clicking on this tab here. This is an internal contract which is going to show up. Uh, in this case, we don't have one. We've got one for Apple. We've got one for Tipco. Let's just take the Apple one here. That then relates this transaction and this asset from that vendor to um, a related vendor contract if it's relevant. 
Okay. We can also assign uh, this uh, request to um, a department at this point as well with related budget and vendor account numbers. Okay. So let me just quickly save this. And that's the information um, required at this point in time. So I'm going to order this by selecting the order button. And you're going to see the status on the purchase order change to ordered. And then that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that item is now out and authorized from um, that vendor to be provided from um, uh, to that stock room. Now, meanwhile, back over here, Joe can then see um, the status of his request without him moving through his lifecycle. When this updates, Joe can come track that from the self-service portal as to when uh, and where he can expect um, his new requested item to be delivered. You can see here it's gone from approved into fulfillment process. So Joe knows that it's um, winding its way through the procurement and delivery process and should be with him uh, within the um, target date. Okay. So back over here, let's just go back up to the parent request. You can see now that the request has been approved, the state's been approved, and we're still working our way through the uh, purchase order um, receive process. So once again, going back into the, the um, purchase order, I can then click on the receive button, and that then um, establishes some date timestamps and some validation as to where and when this um, asset's to be delivered. So it's still going to Southern California, the details are still um, in place. Now, selecting this, this then enables me to stick an asset tag and a serial number on as part of the receive process. So I can come in here and just enter in an asset tag and throw in some sort of a serial tag number there as well. So this is actually going to populate the asset information related to this newly created asset record for this laptop. When I click on OK from here, you can now see that it's been requested, it's been ordered, it's been received, and we're actually starting to create an asset record for um, that received item. Purchase order line item is done. We've got a receiving slip, date time stamp with your audit trail as to when that was received, who it was received, when that request was fulfilled. We go back into this asset tag over here. And then this lets me start to um, provide additional information around this asset from a fulfillment process. I've got general information through here. You can see it's in stock. Uh, when we're finished with um, this tag, we're going to actually assign this to Joe and change the state on this um, request. Um, I can put managed information through here, owned by parent, CI classes, department company. Financial information through here. You can see we've automatically populated the request line item, the purchase order item, the receiving item. So you've got a single pane view of the entire lifecycle process of Joe's request the uh, purchasing request, the fulfillment request, and the delivery request, all in the same record at the same time from the same process. Okay, I can provide an invoice number, costing information if that's changed. Vendor was automatically populated as well. Opens, ordered, received. Again, some SLA metrics there for um, customer performance and, and customer SAT um, issues as well. Um, also at this time, I can provide cost center information, the GL account information if that's necessary or relevant. Okay. You can also see that um, ServiceNow has also created a, an expense line for that brand new asset. So based on that, it's an automatically generated expense line for $529 for that brand new Asus A53 laptop assigned to Joe based on his request and the approval process that's been um, already, de <coughs> excuse me, that's been previously um, de defined. Okay. Disposal. Some information through here. We can actually provide in here um, scheduled retired information. So what I'm going to do is just go to today and manually change that to 2016. What that will then do, um, again, as we saw at the start of the process, um, that enables Joe to understand his entitlements and the life cycle and the expected life cycle of this particular asset and when this is, in, is scheduled to be refreshed. Quickly save that. Okay. We can also provide some additional financial information here as well relating to depreciation, if that's um, necessary. Depreciation plans, um, standard part of financial management inside of ServiceNow. Straight line, one year, we'll put that in through there. The effective date, when it starts, when it stops. Salvage value, if anything. Residual date, residual value, and de depreciated amounts um, as this moves forward. Um, straight line depreciation over one year, so it's going to you know, decrement by uh, one twelfth per month uh, over the life cycle of this asset. 
contract information. Once again, we can provide in things like warranty contract information, service contract information if that's relevant to this asset, as well as support group and supported by. They can also be brought into here as well at the time that the asset's been um, received and inserted into the um, asset process. And any kind of entitlements related to hardware or software can also be related to this as well. Um, typically, um, hardware computer assets are related to things like operating system CALs, uh, office suite CALs, uh, any of those sorts of things can also be um, attached to this um, record as well. Okay, so let me just save that. So once again, taking a step back here to our general tab, uh, we can then change the state of this from in stock to in use. And you're going to see a number of things happening here. So substate changed, assigned to Joe employee changed in his current location from um, the user tables inside of ServiceNow have all been um, updated here as well. I update that, and our request is closed, and Joe's got a brand new um, Asus laptop assigned to him. Okay, just to finish that off, we can also go back over here. Joe can then see the update on his process as it works its way through here. Actually, we haven't configured this thing yet, so let's go back to the, um, the um, parent request and just complete that. Okay, so our catalog task is completed. We can then move forward with uh, providing that um, task to Joe and completing the order. Okay, a couple things around um, some of the um, base tables that we just looked at. Um, very important table inside of ServiceNow for combining a number of processes related to the asset management piece um, is a process called model management. Okay. So model management enables um, a number of things to happen from configuration um, and relation, relationship between the configuration management database as well as um, asset processes as well. Model categories bring together a number of different pieces of information inside of ServiceNow and enables um, some parallel processing to be done um, for several different things. Okay, so what I want to do is bring up here is um, the Apple uh, model um, categories once this loads up through here. So this is a company view. So this would be a company and or a vendor or a manufacturer as uh, in terms of the hierarchy of the asset data. So we've got Apple here. I've got a number of Apple product models related to this. Um, you can see assets related to those product models. So different types of Apple um, kits, um, iMacs, Mac books, um, iPads, iPhones. This is all captured under um, the Apple view here. I can also tie in contracts. I can tie in purchase orders. So again, uh, a single source of information for um, inf asset information through contracts, through vendors, an entire vendor portfolio view of information inside of ServiceNow related there you go. to um, Apple. John, Hello. you're back. You were, you were gone for about uh, 30 seconds there. Oh. Uh-oh, that's not good. Okay, so um, where did I uh, fade out there, Jeff? Um, about 30 seconds ago. Oh, okay. Well, I can't think of what I was saying 30 seconds ago. Um, okay. Co uh, sorry, okay, single view, company portfolio view of assets, um, purchase orders, vendor catalog items related to um, a single vendor or manufacturer. All brought together under one view here, under this um, company here. Uh, a number of things here related to product models and vendor catalog models. So models um, enable you to um, set certain parameters and relationships um, between um, assets uh, and configuration uh, CIs. So in this case, this is a, a hard, uh, sorry, this is a hardware um, class asset. Display names, MacBook Air 13. You got some information through here, what the class of this is, um, asset tracking strategies enabled through here. Acquisition method, if that's uh, necessary at this point. Model number, status. Basic information about um, the actual class itself, whether there's any compatibles or substitutes related to um, this class. The list of assets through here. So these are all the MacBook Airs in the system uh, right now in terms of the asset tag assigned to, as well as the company, costing information, classes, status, as well as location, if that's necessary. Uh, we both got stockroom information as well as um, state information um, established through here, as well as um, related configuration items. Um, hardware models en enable you to um, make the relationship between CIs and um, 
asset classes as well. Uh, in the case of creating CIs, can automatically create a related asset based on certain um, relationships between classes, and vice versa. Um, creating an asset will automatically create um, a CI for um, that particular um, asset class as well. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry, that's not where I want to be. Bear with me here. The product models enable you to set up uh, those parameters, so that makes the relationship between um, the CI and um, the asset class. So you can see through here, um, the assets and configuration items are related as far as um, the this particular um, hardware model is concerned. Okay, so models bring together a number of different processes in um, ServiceNow: um, configuration management, asset management, contract management, service catalog request management, and uh, vendor management. A lot of things um, are related through the ServiceNow process uh, with, pro <clears throat> excuse me, with models. Um, some of the things you can do with models, um, they're a single repository for information about device models that can be shared by assets and CIs um, in your environment. This allows you to easily report on things like how much you spend on a particular model, how many incidents are open against a particular model, which models have upcoming end of life dates and end of warranty dates, and the ratio of desktops, laptops, and other you know, standard KPIs uh, inside of your environment. Models also provide the basis for catalog items, including vendor catalog items, and this provides you with uh, some identity and some input into um, things you already have in stock and versus things that you may have to procure. We saw that in the uh, small scenario walkthrough there. Um, and it enables you to create vendor items to help make decisions on where purchase items are in terms of uh, your procurement process. Model categories associate, excuse me, associate CI classes with asset classes and determine if ServiceNow should create a specific asset class from a CI. Okay. Asset classes in the base systems are hardware, software license, and consumables. You can associate a model category to many models and a model to many model categories. For example, a specific model of a computer can be a computer and a server um, as part of a, a configuration or a bundle. Okay. Inventory management we touched on. Uh, we defined some stock rooms here. These are all our San Diego and California things. And that's part of the procurement process and inventory process where transfer orders can be created uh, for the movement of um, stock and assets and CIs between um, the specific locations. Procurement process we touched on. Um, Items, tasks, purchase order, transfer orders, that's all done as part of um, the ServiceNow procurement process and all wrapped up with reports, gauges, home pages, all those sorts of things as well. Okay. Um, that's it for the demonstration. Um, I'd just like to take a step back into the uh, PowerPoint deck now. Just bear with me for one second. <clears throat> and what we're going to look at now is just some best practices um, around an implementation methodology for asset management inside of ServiceNow. Okay, so as we Touched on before, um, typically we start off by looking at an asset management lifecycle. Um, some of the typical stages that we would see be a planning stage um, with budgeting, capacity planning, chargebacks, that type of um, process information or related um, processes are established at that point. Uh, acquisition strategy, acquisition methodology, um, request approval, purchasing, receiving, uh, relationships to vendors, uh, that would all be done as part of um, an acquisition um, uh, planning stage, as well as relationships into um, con contract management and vendor management as well. Stewardship, um, warehousing, configuration installation, move ads changes, uh, CMDB, service requests, um, those types of things would be part of a stewardship process. That typically relates to the handling of assets within um, an organization, uh, the life cycle, and then the relationships between assets and uh, the consumers of um, the services within inside of your organization. And then at the end of the life cycle, um, things like disposition, retirement, retrieval, um, taking into account for a damaged or stolen uh, information, um, end of warranty life cycle, end of leasing life cycles, 
that's all done as part of a uh, disposition phase in an asset management asset life cycle. So how to start the project? Um, asset management scope uh, determine processes to be included, possible data sources for um, asset information and data. Uh, any kind of integration points into other processes or other platforms uh, in your organization. And last but not least, of course, reporting requirements, KPIs, metrics around um, measuring the asset lifecycle process. Some detail around the scope, um, questions around what's being tracked, um, how granularity, what level of granularity, PCs, monitors, consumable, mice, uh, those sorts of things as well. Which attributes of the assets need to be tracked? Uh, what it is you want to track? Uh, which process inside the service now these assets are going to be tracked to? Um, life cycle of the processes, audit controls, uh, data quality issues, that's all determined at this point as well. Um, as we touched on through here, relationships between asset management and CMDB, that's also a very large um, consideration for um, the scope of your asset uh, management um, project. <clears throat> Process is typically what we see, again, as we touched on, uh, planning, acquisition, stewardship, disposal. Um, these are normally um, life cycle points and transitions between the life cycles um, inside a service, now um, asset process, and should be mapped out um, in terms of um, roles-based role access, as well as the um, provisioning and the um, consumption of the um, services related to um, the asset process. Data sources. Everybody's got multiple data sources um, for the asset process, both existing platforms, uh, things like ERP pra uh, platforms, um, other types of financial information, um, other uh, information. Uh, develop a strategy as to what type of data is going to be brought into ServiceNow, uh, how it's going to be, um, like how information is going to be created, how information is going to be updated, uh, possible two-way integrations uh, between the systems, where and when and you know, how that type of information has happened, method of the uh, integrations, things like web services, um, email, uh, CSV, FTP, all those sorts of things can be determined at this point. Quality of the data, what has to come across, um, data sync. Synchronization, uh, making sure that the data is um, synchronized and aligned on both ends of the transaction, both in ServiceNow as well as on the external platform. Um, decide, decide how to get the data consolidated. How to get it in ServiceNow, and more importantly, what do you do with it once you get it in there? Uh, also, uh, as we touched on for um, two-way integration, what happens to um, trigger exchanges of information back into the um, target platform on the other side? Integrations. We had touched on that. Uh, import, export, integrations of both, one way, two way, inbound from ServiceNow, outbound from ServiceNow, two way integrations with the external platforms, uh, definitive data sources, asset discovery tools, network management tools. Um, things like governance and data quality processes are very, very key here in order to uh, ensure um, synchronization um, and then compliance to any kind of uh, uh, governance frameworks you may have. Uh, audit controls, that sort of thing. Uh, this is very, very important to make sure that the data is and the processes are synchronized uh, on both ends uh, of the synchronization or the integration um, uh, endpoints. And last but not least, reporting. These are some sample um, reports or sample report categories for metrics and KPIs that we've um, implemented and used with some of our clients over the last couple of years. Okay. Um, project summary, um, typically we see a phase one uh, of a discovery process, um, requirements gathering, um, solution design, capturing stories, um, creating sprints, epics, those sorts of things. Um, obtain documents and requirements from um, our, our clients and our customers, discuss them in context of the uh, process needs inside of ServiceNow, data points, uh, transition points, update points, all that sort of a thing. Um, all those, these topics here are usually done as part of an initial discovery um, activity to really understand what the requirements and needs are for uh, the asset management project. Requirements and design, um, solutioning at this point, uh, prototyping, uh, gather documents, configuration parameters, stories, epic sprints, all that's usually uh, determined between the first two phases through here. Um, at the end of this, um, normally um, build activities are going to start. Uh, coming through here. So this is a, a detailed design, uh, functional and technical requirements are established here, um, reporting requirements are established and, and acknowledged, and uh, all that information is then put into um, a standard technical design document as we move forward into the um, build phase. 
deploying test. Build it, test it, fix it, uh, review it. Um, Alcor does do the uh, follows the Agile Scrum methodology, uh, incremental um, deliveries, uh, reviews, requirements gathering. Uh, just make sure that uh, the delivered um, solution meets your requirements from all aspects and perspectives of um, your requirements. Refine reporting requirements, refine the business requirements, refine everything is done in this phase um, through the initial um, build and test. Transition. Um, transition into live production use of the solution. Again, pretty standard stuff through here. At the end of uh, testing, do formal UAT testing, um, any last um, modifications and um, enhancements to the process, uh, purge, um, test dummy data, that kind of a thing, and then come up with a uh, transition plan to um, go into, uh, sorry, to take the um, solution into the um, live production environments. And I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. That's me. Um, I'm part of a team here. It's just not me. <laughs> so please, if you have any uh, questions or anything like that, um, any anything that you would like uh, to um, further information on about the uh, presentation for today or the asset strategy we just articulated, please get in touch with me, that email address and that phone number, and uh, we're more than happy to um, help you with any questions that you may have. And at this point, I think I can throw the floor open to questions. Jeff. Correct. Thanks very much, John. That was excellent, very informative. Um, we have received uh, a couple of questions, uh, which I will get to in a moment. Uh, as a reminder, uh, please use the question section uh, to ask John a question on today's topic. So let me get to the questions here. Um, what is typical cycle time for uh, an implementation of this solution? Um, I've never done a typical project yet. <laughs> um, I would think probably 12 to 16 weeks um, through the um, discovery, um, uh, build and test, and uh, transition phase. Uh, a lot of it's got to do with um, the, the data sources for the assets. A lot of it's got to do with the uh, complexity of, for example, the procurement process. You know, how many layers of approvals that you've got, um, integration points between um, different systems, ERP systems, that kind of a thing. Um, I think that would be a, an average or a sweet spot would be around 16 weeks, typically. That's what we see. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let me see this next one here. Um, details like uh, asset details like life cycle, cost center, uh, can they be updated um, in a bulk upload rather than one by one? Uh, sorry, what details, Jeff? So asset details like life cycle, cost center, things like that. Uh, absolutely. Um, normally, they'll be part of our. Actually, just a second here. They would be part of um, the transition. Excuse me. Uh, they would be part of the definition and, and core um, set of activities around the process itself. We would go through and understand uh, what the requirements are from the vendor, contract, costing, um, asset model perspective. All that information would be um, identified, um, obtained and scrubbed, and then imported into um, ServiceNow prior to the actual asset lifecycle being um, deployed. Most of it tends to be base information and is required um, to actually um, to, to make the lifecycle work or the uh, process work. Um, can it be updated? Absolutely. Um, it's not carved in stone. It can be updated at some point in the future, but you know, keeping in mind this is a financial application, so most of the um, base information and the controls would be in place up front. So I think the short answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, so, but what about in a bulk upload or a, a, some sort of an import? Yeah, um, ServiceNet does support import sets um, with multiple data sources, either from a spreadsheet or a CSV file uh, or an external database or through a web service. Uh, any number of ways of getting that information in. Um, import sets, if you're not familiar with them, there's two parts. There's a data source uh, pointing at the source data and the format of the data, and then there's a transform map which matches up the um, source data schema and then the target uh, data schema. So you would run that for you know one record, 10 records, 1,000 records. It uh, doesn't matter what it is. Um, ServiceNow does support bulk imports into the, into the process, into the data tables. OK. 
Okay. All right. Um, this question, this next question, is about how to handle uh, a refilling of a stock room. So let's see. Create a request for 10 PCs, uh, and then a PO is received uh, that creates 10 new unassigned assets. And so, so I guess basically, is what's the process to refill a stock room? Um, let's go have a look at that. That was part of the purchase order Keeping process. In mind you here just looked at what? Keeping in mind you have ten minutes. Uh, okay, let's let's be brief. Um, as part of the purchase order or procurement process, you notice that um, the purchase order I used was for a single item. Um, the receive part of that purchase order um, required me to select the stock room for that particular item. Okay, let me see if I can find one here. What is this? This is a uh, uh, yeah, this is a consumable. So when I receive these things here, you can see here that I got multiple items going to a single warehouse. So as part of the purchase order process, when you set up an initial request, you can select multiples of uh, a single item and then have them go to, you know, as part of a single uh, receive process, or you can do, you know, partial receives as well. Okay, so when we receive, you know, we hit that receive button, we can select the um, line items from the purchase order. We can select the target stock room, and then you know, necessary if you want to, you know, do the asset stuff here as well. And that will then take you know two or three of those items and put them into that stock room. We could just as easily have done, you know, if there was ten MacBook Pros, we could have had all ten go into the stock room at the same time. Is that? I think that answers the question. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it does. Uh, all right. Let me get to the next one. I've got a fair number here coming in. Um, okay. So we talked about typical project time. Um, what about the number of people involved um, for a standard, typical, average project? Um, is it two to three people uh, on the on the customer side? I'm assuming, uh, or is it more like six to ten people? Um, a lot of it depends on the roles that you set up for your um, purchasing inventory procurement process internally. Um, you know, typical roles that we would see uh, would be something like a process owner, an asset manager, an asset analyst, um, asset owners and stakeholders, procurement agents, procurement managers, inventory agents, inventory managers. So everybody's got you know a, a role to play in this process. So depending on the complexity of your process, whether you're doing warehousing and stockroom management, whether you're doing procurement management. That's going to determine who's involved in the process. Um, the end-to-end -end process that we just displayed there, though, I think there's about four or five different roles, as well as a layer of management above that. You know, we were dealing with asset managers, we were dealing with procurement staff, we were dealing with inventory people as well. So a lot of it's going to be depend on the complexity of your process. Okay, and then on the on the consulting side or the Alcor side, we would have probably four to six people. Uh, yeah, um, typically, you know, we have our structure um, provides you with an engagement manager as well as process consultants and uh, delivery coordinators, as we refer to them, and then uh, technical consultants. The process consultants and delivery coordinators are, 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 are customer facing. They're the ones that um, define the requirements, um, define the stories, manage the scrums and sprints, and then ultimately the uh, build and testing of the applications. Okay, so anywhere from depending on the complexity and the size of the project, you know, three to six, I think, is a typical amount for um, an Alcor team. Okay. All right. Um, what about uh, physically tagging an asset? Is there a requirement to physically tag uh, an asset to be able to track it? Um, I hate saying it depends, but it depends. Um, it depends on the nature of your business and your business requirements. Um, I work with clients where um, Physical asset tagging, RFID tagging, you know, that type of stuff was absolutely mandatory um, for um, their business purposes. I'll give you an example of a customer I can't really name, but they're a, you know, a large TV um, content provider that does a Shark Week thing every year, if that gives you a hint. Um, they're based out of um, just outside of Washington, D.C., and they have a number of the scenario that we were working with was video and audio editing suites. And these are a number of of, these are like bays with a number of different components that keep getting shifted in and out of these um, editing um, bays. So these things have anywhere from 12, uh, 40 to 50 um, different types of components. Um, they're being refreshed, they're being pulled out for service, they're being pulled out you know, to be upgraded and retired on a daily basis. And their requirements were to um, do the front end, 
contractual procurement process and then the physical location of the assets themselves. So essentially, they had a kid you know, with a barcode scanner scanning these components as they walked in and out of these um, editing bays on an hourly basis um, as far as that goes. That's not out of the, you know, the, the, that's not outside of a typical use of an asset management process. Um, what it does is it establishes at a point in time the location of a specific asset with a tag on it and its disposition, whether it's coming, whether it's going, whether it's going in for service, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, in that case, that was an absolute requirement for that process for that business. Um, your mileage may vary depending on what your needs are and what your requirements are, but having said all that, ServiceNow does support um, inputs from a barcode scanning um, tool, external tool, also works off of iPhones and stuff like that as well as Android, so if that's, you know, that's a, that's a consideration. Just another step in the life okay. cycle. When All things right. change, you bark on it. Right? right, right. Now, this next question is probably a, a, an Alcor webinar into itself. Um, what is the relationship between discovery, CMDB, and asset management? Uh, I don't know if you can answer that in five minutes. No, I can't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it's going to have to be, uh, you know, in fact, it is a webinar by itself. Um, I got a slide. Let me just show you quickly um, my slide. And this, you know, this is the, the throw, as they say in the TV business. Can you, can you see this? Jeff, can you see the slide? Yes, yes. yes oh, okay, see great. It. So this is the five-minute version. Okay, the, the, the deeper, <laughs> it's a little bit longer. So the difference is, you know, auto discovery is kind of real-time. It, it does a snapshot. Um, at a point in time of, of your infrastructure. It's kind of like taking a picture of a river. Um, it's going to be different in five minutes. It was different 10 minutes ago. Um, what it does is where stuff is now, um, possibly who's using it, maybe a physical location, uh, either based on a subnet or you know, location-based subnet, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, it's dynamic. It's um, transitory. It changes all the time. Uh, good for initial population of asset database and verification and gap analysis. And if you do that right, it really should give you more questions and answers as to what's actually out there. So um, that's what a discovery tool typically does. It's part of a ver verification, validation, and reconciliation process with asset management. Asset management tends to be somewhat more static, um, comes from a contractual or you know, procurement process. It's the buy data related to contracts. It's what you're entitled to. It's what you bought. It's the entire you know, back data of um, request, request fulfillment, approval, um, receive process, all financial information, stuff you typically can't get from the discovery process. We tie this all together uh, as part of an overall lifecycle process with discovery, CMDB, as well as asset management. And that will be the topic of our next seminar, so stay tuned. Okay. All right. Well, um, we've got three minutes, and I've got one more question that just popped in here. Um, what happens if a hardware device in CNDB is returned to stock and then later reused? Example, printer 001 is sent back to stock, printer 002 breaks down, and an old printer is picked from stock. How do we follow the CI versus asset? Same asset is used for two different CIs. Um, it depends on that structure. You know, it, assets and CIs typically should be one one. I mean, I understand the different classifications. You know, for you know, there's a server and there's an operating system on a server, and that's part of a rack mount. You know, that kind of a thing. But it depends on the granularity that you're tracking your individual assets. First of all, secondly, most of that stuff, if you're doing this correctly, should be part of a change process. When you change the state of an asset, or you change the state of a CI, or you know, more importantly, if, if you've got your CNDB tied into a discovery process, you should be flagging these changes in states to your CIs. That should be um, part of a change process, either you know, proactive or reactive, before the, uh, the fact or after the fact. Okay, that's what I mentioned when I mentioned when I said that your discovery process should be giving more questions and answers uh, about the state of your your CIs. So. You've got that configured to look for, you know, period over period changes in states or changes in dispositions. Laptops are there. Laptops aren't there. You haven't seen stuff for 90 days, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, different computers come in and out of networks, different IP addresses changes. There's a lot of dynamic things that are going on with the discovery process, which should relate back to an asset process as part of reconciliation. Um, that's why the middle piece uh, around the reconciliation between 
um, discovery source data and asset source data, dynamic versus static, is very, very important to answer those types of questions. Uh, as I said before, that should be a change process. If you're changing the state, if a relationship between an asset and a person or an asset and a location, that kind of a thing is changed, typically you want to know why that's changed, what happened to it. From a governance perspective, for things like Sarbanes-Oxley controls, that's a very, very key element of that uh, type of compliance process. Um, and that should be backed up by a uh, change process. All right. Yeah, so judging by the uh, the number of people that registered for this seminar and the fact that we got as many questions as we did, I think it uh, it just goes to show, uh, you know, this is a pretty important topic and a very um, top of mind topic for a lot of people. So, you know, as John mentioned, um, and he provided his contact details, please reach out to John or me or anybody at Alcor or contact us through the Alcor website uh, to get some additional information. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, our time is up for today. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will be available on the website, www.alcortech.com, and on our social networking sites. Um, there will also be a new white paper on asset management available in the white paper section on the Alcor website. Thanks everyone for joining. See you at the next webinar. Thank you very much for your time.